So, this morning's sermon, I riffed off of the sanctified art, and it seems to be a good theme. So, today's sermon will be simply entitled, A Dream Confirmed. In 1951, the poet Langston Hughes published a book of poetry entitled Montages of a Dream Deferred. It included the poem which went on to be one of his most famous poems, A Dream Deferred. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? This poem directly spoke to the plight of many African Americans at the time as the early stirrings of the modern civil rights movement were beginning to formulate. From, from Hughes's words, the playwright Lorraine Hansberry went on to produce her award-winning play, A Raisin in the Sun, about the challenges facing a Black family on the south side of Chicago that had the opportunity to move into better housing and just how much of a system of oppression they faced through redlining that stood in their way. Their shot at the American dream was a dream deferred, dried up like a raisin in the sun. Dreams are a funny thing though. Dreams sometimes refer to the thing that happens when our brains enter REM sleep. Dreams can take the unfinished thoughts of the day, those moments that you put on the back burner that you forgot about, and somehow in the dream state, they get all masked up together in weird and confusing ways. Then other times, the same thing happens when we're wide awake, and it's called daydreaming. We get lost in our own thoughts, staring out into space with one thought germinating another, spinning and tumbling like clothes in a dryer. Daydreams can be one thought after, an after another, falling down a rabbit hole with one scenario more unbelievable than the other. Like I said, dreams are a funny thing. With within dreams, the limits of time and space don't seem to exist. And, and if they do, the rules are different. One of, one of my favorite movies is Christopher Nolan's Inception. It takes place in a future where people can go into someone else's mind through a machine using chemical com compounds pumped directly into the brains of the participants. And in the movie, they talk about dreams within dreams, within dreams, three layers. One of the movie rules was that the more layers you go down, the longer the time feels. You could feel like it's 10 years, but it's only been one hour that you've been asleep. You ever notice after a heavy sleep in which you've had a really vivid dream where it feels like the dream spanned over a long time, you almost feel tired when you wake up and you realize it's only 2.30 in the morning. It couldn't have been that long. You have another five hours of sleep to go. Yes, dreams are a funny thing. Dreams can be so vivid. All of the emotions and the sensations are so real. They're tangible but also not tangible and not real at the same time. I know in, in my own dream, so often while the dream is happening, there can be a moment in which I know that I'm dreaming. I know that none of this is real. Dreams are the places where the rules of the game don't exist anymore. Dreams are the places where dead people come back to life. Friends and family members that are long gone somehow find a way from beyond the veil to become alive again for us in dreams. Dreams are also the places for our fears to become nightmares. Nightmares from the scary movie we may have watched, from the anxieties we live with because what we have seen on the news or heard from a neighbor. But also dreams are the metaphorical way in which here in Western culture, we talk about aspirations and longings. Some of us dream about better futures for the neighborhoods we live in. We dream about better tomorrows for our offspring and generations to come. Here at this church, we dream about a better planet and a better way of living in harmony with the land on which we reside. 
And for some, that ever elusive American dream is still an existential anchor that fuels the work ethic of many. And for so many, it's just a dream deferred, even a dream denied. But in ancient Hebraic culture, dreams were often understood as a way that God communicated with God's people. In the 66 books of the Protestant biblical canon, there are 21 recorded instances of God communicating through a dream, five of which are in the book of Matthew. One of them is today's sermon text. Sermon is one of them is today's sermon text. Sermon's text. Wow, I really stumbled over that one. Now I'll admit. I've never had God talk to me directly in a dream. That's not my testimony. But I'm not shocked that in ancient culture, and for an ancient culture, that they believed, that believed in God and saw God perform many miracles that led to their deliverance and safety, meaning they already knew about the supernatural performance of God, that dreams would be as likely a place as any to encounter the divine. So here we are. The second time, a man named Joseph had a dream. And this was a dream about incarnation of God with us, God as human, God as person, God with us. And in this text, another man named Joseph finds himself in a conundrum. The woman of whom he is with is now pregnant. He's not married to her. And he knows that this baby is not his. If, if daytime television were a thing in first century Palestine, Maury Povich would have hit the jackpot with the big reveal of the DNA test results on this one. Now, I, I, like, I, like, I, like, I like Eugene Patterson's interpretation right here. While he was trying to figure a way out, he had a dream. Now, there's just something to be said about God working out things while we're trying to figure it out. There's a gospel song out of Chicago I grew up hearing called Jesus Will Work It Out. And in the refrain, in the vamp, the choir, it just keeps on repeating, Jesus will work it out. And they kind of do a falling with the tenors and the altos and the sopranos. And, that, and they keep on saying Jesus will, will work it out in response to the soloist's call. So you have this call and response thing going back and forth. Her call is a bunch of ad libs. And one of the ad libs that the soloist says, Diane Williams, while you're trying to figure it out, God's already worked it out. And like I said, while God speaking through my dreams isn't my testimony, knowing that God has worked things out, while I was trying to figure it out, certainly is. The translation of Greek by Eugene Peterson of while Joseph was trying to figure a way out. I think that's where this very familiar story pivots. While yes, the, 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 the fullness of the scripture is really about the anticipation of the coming of Christ into the world as Jesus, God's only begotten, I don't want us to miss the implications of what it means to live by faith in situations where it seems as though you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Many, many of us, we find ourselves having gone on with life as usual. It has its usual twists and turns, but maybe just, you know, maybe nothing ever really jarred us to the core up until that point. We've been bumbling through life, if we can be honest, maybe even on autopilot at a certain point. And at that point, most, if not all, of our needs are being met. And every now and again, we are able to get some of our wants. Being, we're able to be the good people society tells us that we're supposed to be. And then just suddenly, life happens. And usually, life happens on life's terms. We don't get to have a say in it. And we come to this crossroads, and we see that none of the decisions laid before us have any great options. Joseph is like many of us at some of the points in our lives. Uh, a, a man plucked out of obscurity, minding his own business as a woodworker and betrothed to a woman named Mary. If he stays with her, he'd be raising a baby that he doesn't know who the father is. And if he left her, he'd be leaving a young girl 
single with a baby in a patriarchal world where a woman's work and livelihood was solely connected to either her father or her husband. Neither of the options were great. Neither of the options were going to leave Joseph feeling as though he made the right decision. No matter how he tried to plan it out, he was always going to be left with wondering, what if I had chosen the other way? And then God being God worked it out. Now, maybe a few of you all actually do know my story, my testimony as to how I arrived here at Boston and here at this church. Now, at first glance, it sounds nice and neat. I applied to the PhD program at Boston University School of Theology, and upon acceptance, I wanted to make sure I was connected to a church, and luckily, the Church of the Covenant had an opening position, and we mutually decided to enter covenant with each other. That is the story packaged nicely and neatly, and it's actually not a lot. It really is how it went, but it's not the full story, and to tell it as such, betrays the wonder-working power of God entering the year 2020 before COVID was even a real thing. I was a layoff candidate. I initially got waitlisted for the PhD program, which means I really actually didn't get in. I was offered a spot in the Master of Sacred Theology program, which I accepted, but it wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't what I had dreamed about. So I entered the long, hot summer of 2020 without any job prospects. It was a bleak outlook. My apartment lease ended on July 19th, and school didn't start until September. But I should have known God was up to something when my leasing agency said, we can move you to month to month, you know, beyond after, outside of your lease. So I got an email on July 28th saying that a position in the fall cohort for the incoming PhD students opened up, and did I want it? So of course, I said yes. But let me be clear. I had fallen to a very low point at, before July 28th. My job was ending. It was the middle of a pandemic. I had a car note that still needed to be paid. And I was faced with the prospect of moving in with a friend to a large but full house, moving from having my own space to having three roommates, three roommates, and an eight-year-old kid, or moving back home to the room that I grew up in in Chicago. Now, while yes, none of these options would have left me in house and those would have been blessings still, but none of these options were going to be best for my then fragile mental state. So while I was sitting trying to figure it out, God was already working it out. While I didn't have a dream like Joseph, the email I received on July 28th was still a message from God, the angel being the director of admissions, the acceptance being a dream confirmed. Joseph was told by the angel to stay with Mary. Don't leave her. Stick it out. It will be worth it in the end. The dream he had was confirmed just a short while later. So I'm here to tell you on the fourth Sunday of Advent, the word of the Lord is true. People of God, as we celebrate the hallmark of our faith, the birth of Jesus into our midst. Remember that even when we think we don't have a lot of great options, God is working behind the scenes. I am a living witness that there are God forces in the universe conspiring to come together for your good, for our good. Paul puts it this way, be not weary in well-doing for in due season, you shall reap a harvest if you don't faint. I'm gonna put it this way and I leave you with this, stay the course, Keep the faith, for when morning comes, your dream will be confirmed. The word of God for the people of God.